Hey everybody, welcome to Pass Summit 2020. Not in the States. Well, some of you might be in the States, but um, I'm here in the UK, in the southwest of the UK. And hopefully you're here to learn about Power BI and how amazing big data clusters are when you use them. Oh no, hang on a minute. If you want to learn that stuff, there's plenty of great sessions here, but I'm going to talk about notebooks, PowerShell and Excel automation. So let's do this thing. Please go and have a look at all of the things that PASS has to offer. PASS.org has a whole range of things available for you. Local groups, virtual groups, SQL Saturdays, go and explore those and learn and share and network with other people who do the same thing that you do. Also, it's really important that you, um, first of all, that you have your slide notes up so you can see what's going on, because that makes life much easier. But secondly, that you have, that you fill in your evaluation, because without evaluation, we don't know how well we're doing. Speaking as a speaker, I am happy for you to rate me one or 10. It doesn't, it doesn't matter because it's how it worked for you. Only thing that I ask is that you tell me why. Tell me what it is I did that was great and tell me what I did that was rubbish. Because it's the only way that we can improve. And these days, it's completely different because I'm stood in my front, in my office, in my house. I'm not on a stage in front of a load of people sitting in chairs. So please give us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Also, throw your thing on the floor. So there we go. Managed to throw my clicker on the floor as well. It's going well. So my name is Rob Sewell. I uh, go by he and him as pronouns. And uh, I'm a consultant for um, Sewell's Consulting Limited. So uh, basically just, just me. Uh, and what I do is I help people automate things. I uh, help train. I'm lucky enough to be an MVP um, for data platform and for cloud and data center management. I'm one of the co-authors of the book, DBA Tools in a Month of Lunches with Chrissy Lemaire. And I'm involved in both the PowerShell community and the data community. Um, please feel free to contact me. The best way is via Twitter, SQL DBA with beard. You'll find me there. Here I am. Hello. This, this is where I work. This is where I work and this is now where I present as well. Um, it's weird, isn't it, this world? Uh, I don't think we have enough virtual pass selfies. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave this one here for a minute and um, take a selfie with me. See if you can like do a clip. I can't really do it because all I can see is a green screen, but feel free, take a selfie. These are things that we do. I've seen them on Twitter. I've seen particularly Killer DBA, Homer, and Steve Jones <clears throat> showing off their selfies that they've taken at past, past summits. And we're not gonna be able to do that this year, but maybe we can, maybe we can do something. Okay. Pop quiz. Ben. What yes, do most organizations, where is their data used? Everywhere. What, what, which, which sort of platform do you think it's used? Do you think it's uh, um, SSRS or Power BI or Click or? I'm leaning towards more and more Power BI. Um, if you had asked me that question quite a while ago, um, it would have been SSRS. Um, and then again, well, I, I couldn't come up with a proper answer, to be quite honest. So uh, I'm amazed because the obvious answer is Excel. Oh my God. <laughs> it's true. We know how many times are we asked to provide some data. Okay, we provide Power BI reports and SSRS and we deliver our data as dashboards in many other ways. But 
realistically, most of our users will immediately ask, can I export that into Excel? If we give them the results of a query, then the answer probably will be, can you put that in Excel for me, please? Excel, look at that, that, that is me not being on the right, the right thing. That's awesome, isn't it? Uh, let's try and see if we can do that. There we go. You According look surprisingly Microsoft, green. Yes, I, I did. I did look awfully, awfully green. Um, hopefully that looks a little, a little more better now. Um, According to Microsoft, more than 1.2 billion people use Microsoft Office. 16% of the world's population. When I went looking for silly Excel facts, I thought this was just, just astonishing. And 88% of all Excel workbooks have got errors in them. Who'd have guessed? And also, how do they know? And why did they use a pie chart? Or is that just to annoy the BI people? Um, and when it comes down to this, it's a silly fact. And probably a lot of it's to do with the data or you know, if you're the UK COVID reporting, it's because you're using the wrong version of Excel, but that's a different matter. Um, I like to use automation. but I also like to use Jupyter. This, <clears throat> this is Jupyter. Of course, it's the, the South Pole of the planet Jupiter taken um, on a flyby by Juno. And this isn't the Jupiter that I mean. What I mean is this Jupiter. So you've got Terry and, and Simon and they're data scientists. And these are the folk that use Jupyter notebooks to create predictions and models using Spark and R and Python, and quite frankly, do things that I have no idea what they're doing. I don't understand how and to create the things that they create. But Jupyter notebooks, I understand, and I think they're amazing. And so I thought we'd combine Jupyter Notebooks with PowerShell and with Excel and automation. So I've been automating DBA type tasks with PowerShell into Excel for, for many years. That top blog post is one that I wrote more than six years ago. And it's of a script that I wrote probably eight years ago, and it was the first PowerShell script I wrote that I was really proud of, the one that really made a difference into how I used PowerShell. Because what it enabled me to do was to automate the morning checks for SQL agent jobs, see which ones had failed and which ones had succeeded. And in 60 seconds, I could just scroll through this Excel sheet and the green is good, red is bad. And I could very quickly identify what had failed and what needed to be actioned. And I carried on, I did other things, a number of VLFs I've used as an example there. I've carried on over the years doing this because we all know that our businesses, our business people, our managers, they love to have their data in Excel. Excel is where they feel comfortable. They're able to make charts, make tables, filter the data, uh, put it into pivot tables, do all of these things. And there's a problem here when you come to do this with PowerShell. Because the first thing that you have to do is to manipulate a com object. And nowadays, we no longer need to do that. So we have a PowerShell module called import Excel. And just like this tweet shows, on behalf of everybody who has ever had to work with Excel by manipulating COM objects, thank you for this module.
Because as long as you can write some PowerShell, then you can make use of the import Excel module. Hang on a minute. What is a Jupyter Notebook? Well, as well as doing all of that funky data science stuff, it is a document that can contain text, executable code, images, and query results. So you can even get the results of your query inside the notebook saved as part of your documentation. I've done a number of presentations over the last year, 18 months, about how you can make use of Jupyter Notebooks with PowerShell, with SQL, how saving the results is a really great thing to do, to create run books or to document incidents, all of these good things. But perhaps we can combine that with our love for import Excel and we can start to make life even better. So, unless anybody has any questions, that will so, be the end of the slides. I hear you, Ben. I hear you. The, the, well, um, there is one question by Beth, and she's asking if 64-bit or 32-bit is Excel, Excel is better for data analysis. And uh, um, I'm pretty sure you're a consultant, so I may know the answer. Is it it depends? It, it's obviously, it depends. Because you might not have an operating system that could could install 32-bit Excel. And, and I think that um, the UK government would say that it should definitely be 64, especially after the beating that they've got. But yeah, at this point, they might, yes. That's, that's just a personal opinion, of course. So were there any further questions? Uh, none that are um, not answered for now. They were mostly about slides. Um, oh. And also one comment, apparently there must be real data scientists in your slides because they have those trim beards. They are absolutely, they are. They're real people. <laughs> Terry McCann and Simon Whiteley. So slides, slides is an excellent place to start. So we will start. And I've with... already put the link to these slides to the chat actually, so they have that. They've already got it, excellent. So of you course. can just do that. And away it'll go. Look, and if you type it right, like Ben did, it'll go to <laughs> <laughs> Never type in demos, they say. I say always type in demos. So the other thing you're going to want to know is, as well as the slides, is where is the notebook? Well, the notebook's in the same place, which was kind of what my point was, wasn't it? That's why I did that link. So let's do that again. And this time, I'm not going to let you watch me get it wrong, because autocomplete will help me. Right, that's why we did this. So we can go to 2020, because that's the year we're in. I know it might feel like it's still 2019, but it is that. Um, ben, which, which event are we at? This is Pass Virtual Summit 2020. Excellent. So we'll just call, go to the Pass Summit one. And there is our notebook. And what you can do is you can click this raw button and you can download it. But one of the things I want to show you about notebooks is that most of the time, GitHub will actually render them so that you can even see what they look like. And we're gonna find out whether today is gonna to be one of those days of demo failures or whether today actually stuff is gonna work for me. So come on GitHub, do your funky thing with my notebook. I think GitHub is a consultant. So the question of whether or not it will render your notebook, the answer to that is it depends. It depends. We just don't know on what it actually depends on. So obviously um, today it depends on whether you're doing a presentation or not because it's just not going to work for me. What a shame. Oh, well. You can find other notebooks and you can see them rendered in, in GitHub. I tell people to use Azure Data Studio for working with notebooks. Um, Azure Data Studio, if you don't know, is the new cross-platform data platform tool. It's not replacing Management Studio, it's complementing Management Studio. It does a whole load of other things as well. 
And I say this not just to people who work in the data platform field, but also to the folk that work um, in, um, what's the word? PowerShell. <laughs> That's the word. Also to the, the people that work, work with PowerShell is use this for working with notebooks because it works the best, does things the most wonderfully. So within Azure Data Studio, what we can do is we can press Control Shift and P, and it's going to come up with our command palette. And within our command palette, you can then start typing for the thing that you want to work with. And as you can see, I do a lot of work with notebooks. You can tell that because the most recent menu commands that you used will rise up to the top. So we will type new notebook. And that is then going to get you into a new notebook. You can then create it. This by default comes up as a SQL one. If we drop it down, if like Terry and Simon, you want to do PySpark and Spark R and Python and all of these things, you can use those. But we're going to use PowerShell. So what I said was that Azure Data Studio is cross-platform, and it is. Azure Data Studio will work across Windows, Unix, Mac, exactly the same. One slight bit of difference is the PowerShell kernel because within the PowerShell kernel, it's gonna use the version of PowerShell for your machine. Right now, on a Windows machine, it's gonna use Windows PowerShell. On a Unix machine, it's gonna use PowerShell 7. Here are some cool things about using a notebook. We can write our text. We can add in images. So it has hend Hendy has Hendy things that say uh, this is Ben's notebook. So we can add in a nice heading like this, and then we can come down a bit and maybe we'll change that to uh, no, heading three. This is the most important thing. You can carry on writing your documentation within your notebook. This button here, the rich text view. This is the thing that I think is by far the most interesting, the best one to understand how to use within a notebook. I use notebooks for recording what instance I'm doing. And if I come to this screen over here and I do Windows Shift and S and bring up the snipping tool, um, and I can just do this and I'll come over to here and I'll just paste as if by magic, straight out of my- You are magic. Oh, this, this is not my magic. This is sorcery from the tools team. This is absolutely wonderful. I think this is just the best thing in the world. It will just paste in a screenshot of what you've taken and just display it within your notebook. So, so easy, so beautiful. And it doesn't just work with screenshots. What about if um, you had a OneNote document and maybe your OneNote document looks something like this. You know, maybe it's just something about, what's this? This is a Git workflow. Got a whole notebook telling us how to do Git workflow. It's got some words, it's got some pictures, all done through there. So if we went to here and we did Control A, Control C, and then went back into our notebook and pasted it. And would you look at that? straight into your notebook, we've got the formatted, we've got the images that we've um, copied from our OneNote. And this works with Excel, this works with web pages, this works with all the things. 
there's really a lot of, like I said, sorcery available here. It's truly, truly fantastic. But we want to look at some PowerShell. So within our notebook, whilst you're doing your documentation, whilst you're learning how to work with it, you can then start typing some PowerShell. So we could do uh, get dash, and you even get IntelliSense available to you. So we could do all of the services that have a name that includes SQL. Let me press this play button here. Lo and behold, here we go. Is our SQL server running? Yes, it is. Excellent. That's a good thing because we're going to need it for this um, demonstration. Now, I said our results are always saved with our notebook. So the last part of our notebook is we're going to save this and we'll save it in the temp directory. Don't ever save important things in the temp directory. And nothing is more important than Ben's notebook. I'll make sure I've typed it correctly. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close Azure Data Studio. It's gone. If I come back and I reopen it, Azure Data Studio is so cool, it's going to open my previously saved documents. In fact, as long as autosave has kicked in, it will even keep that autosaved document if you haven't saved it at all. So if I can find my mouse, there we go. So uh, no, thank you very much. I don't want to have any more installations because we're doing a demo. But the thing that you might be asking is, well, where are these results? So you can see we've got our SQL Server. I've got an instance called Dave. So if we do get, if we do get content here, and we go C slash temp slash uh, Ben, which is going to read the contents of the file out into our, oh, oh yeah. What you can see is all the images because they're just basically base64 encoded. But probably I spoke too long and it's run out of the buffer. Oh, it has to as well. Uh, let's, let's, let's try that again. Let's go like that and let's do it a bit quicker. Come on. No, it's not going to cancel me out in time. That's a pain. Because what you will find is that your results are going to be stored inside that file. And what I've just done is crash my demo because as we can see, if we look down here, PowerShell is still spinning around because it's still reading all of that base64. Oh, look, Windows has crashed. <laughs> Should we reopen it? <laughs> I love it when things fall over for me. Uh, let's try that again. This time we won't read the contents of it. Why not? It was fun. It, it was fun for you. It wasn't so much fun for me. What we'll do instead, if we really want to see what's inside there, is we'll go Azure Data Studio C slash temp slash bin. There we go. Oh, of course, look, see? Look at this. Put the twizzle on and where are you oh so what's really funny is that i've just closed it by clicking on it over there <sighs> anyway all of these results are going to be there and sql server is running so let's move on we've got our notebook here and you'll notice i'm going to pause a minute because we were waiting up here at the top for this to say kernel PowerShell. Because until it says that, if you try and run one of the code cells, strange things might happen. And quite frankly, I've done enough strange things straight away. So within this, I've got some documentation. I have now created something that you could download and you can follow and it will work just the same as long as you've got SQL Server on your machine. So what we can do is we can import our modules. So we would just use install module and the name of the module and we pass in scope current user. 
because that means it's going to be installed only for my user account, which means I don't have to worry about permissions. It's definitely just going to be within my profile where I have permissions. Now, with all PowerShell, to find out what commands we have, we can just run get command module and the name of the module. I'll say, don't run that command for DBA tools because there are 563,392,000 commands and it'll just scroll forever. But if we look at the ones for import Excel, you can see you have things like new Excel sheet, new Excel chart even, let's read properly Rob. And we've got add Excel charts, we've got add a worksheet. Hey Rob, um, just real quick, um, some people are having issues seeing the text that you're showing. So um, maybe you just give it a little more real estate. Um, and um, as lovely as it is to see you. I know, I know. What I'm also gonna do, I think is change that because I think this seems to make a difference. And we will go to this one. How about that? That looks perfect. That look more better. At least right? it does to me. If if any of the audience is still having issues, please just raise that again, and then um, I will get back to Rob. So <clears throat> we've got things. Um, what else? Were we? Oh yes, removing removing worksheet. That's good. Open Excel package. We'll come back and have a look at that. But you'll also notice things like pivot chart chart in here. So let's go back to PowerShell and let's understand how we can use PowerShell. We know how to find a command with get dash command. If you use get dash help and the name of the command, it's going to give you the help for that command. And if you add examples, then you can even see the examples for that command you start to work out for yourself what it is that you want to be able to run. So we're gonna do this DBA tools command called get DBA login. I'm gonna choose the SQL instance local host because luckily we've checked that our service was running. And then we're gonna add this pipe symbol. And the pipe symbol says everything that's on the left, the results of that command, please pass down the pipeline to the right. And on the right, this time, I'm just going to do format table for two reasons. One, so that you can see what a pipeline looks like. <clears throat> and secondly, so that the results are ordered in a particular way. <clears throat> so we can see that Rob needs a drink. Excuse me, this is my second session of the day. So my voice is um, on its way after a pre-con as well. So we, um, we've got our logins and maybe Ben had come to me and said hey Rob can you get me all of the logins that are on this instance he says yeah sure come and look at this look at this screen no 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 no. I don't want them in the screen I want them in Excel okay here's the trick as soon as you know how to get your results all you need to do is pass them down the pipeline with the pipe symbol to the command export Excel and then give it the path to the file that you want to create. This second line of code is just going to open the Excel file. It's going to open whatever you pass to it with the default program. So we're going to run that. It's going to grab our uh, logins from our instance and it's going to pop up with Excel. It doesn't actually pop up in front of Azure Data Studio, but as you can see, there are some updates for um, Microsoft Office, which I've not installed because I'm about to do a demonstration, but we've got all of our logins into Excel as quickly as that. So that's really neat, but you know, Ben's going to want to come in and change all of these column headings and turn it into a table. So perhaps we'll see if we can do that a little bit better. So at this time, we're going to run our get DBA login command pass the results down the pipeline to export Excel, give it the path name and add auto size. And when we add auto size, what we get is, look at that. Now, for some reason, it doesn't quite work with date times. And I don't know why, they're always just slightly out, but we've managed to get 
our data into Excel and auto sized the columns for the um, for the, the contents. So that's good. But we'd like to be able to do that, that filter thing as well. So let's do that. We'll get our logins again. We'll pass that down the pipeline to export Excel and we'll add auto size and auto filter. When we run that one, what we get is our Excel sheet. And this time we could pick, oh, I don't know, what have we got here? Um, is locked, there we go. So we could say, no, I only want to see the ones where it's blank. Be beautiful. Now we're starting to make something that's useful for, for Ben, but for whoever it is that asks for our Excel. Well, how about if we take it another step further? I put it all on one line because why not? And we'll go get DBA login. We'll grab all of our logins. We'll pass them down the pipeline to export Excel. We'll put in the path, we'll auto size and we'll auto filter. And this time we'll give a title of the logins and we'll name a worksheet logins. And if we pass the show parameter, it's gonna automatically open our Excel for us just like this. There we go. So we've got Excel opened. And this time we, as you can see, I've, oh, oh, well, that's weird, isn't it? If we look, we've got a new worksheet. We've, when we find our mouse, we've got a new worksheet called logins, but we've still got sheet one. And sheet one is still got all of our original data in it. So why did it do that? We've used the same name of our file and the same file path all the way through. So what's happened here is import Excel, the module has taken these results. They said, oh, I know what you want. What you want is you want me to open this Excel that already exists and then pass these results in and auto size them and auto filter them and give them a title of the logins and a worksheet name in a worksheet name called logins. I'll do that for you. So that's cool. Really useful for when we want to be able to add to an existing Excel sheet or update an existing Excel sheet. Because as you saw with the first few examples, we overwrote the Excel with the new values. So each one of those sheet ones were updated with the auto size, with the auto filter, et cetera. Now we did it all on one line then just because we could do it all on one line. But the problem is, is that if I carry on adding things onto here, it's gonna run off the end of the screen horizontally and you're not gonna be able to see everything. And it's not quite so easy to read. So let me introduce you to something called splatting. Now splatting is not only a funny word, but it is a way for us to pass in parameters to PowerShell and make them easier for, to read, I think. The way we do it is we create a hash table like this. We have a dollar, which says that this is a variable. Say we call it export Excel parameters because you should always name your, param your parameters, your variables, so that they make sense. We use an at sign and curly braces, and then we use key value pairs in a list. So it's the same thing as we had before. We had a path, we had an auto size, auto filter, title. And you can see here, we've got path equals. There's no dash required at the beginning. Auto size, we've got to say equals to true. Auto filter, we've got a title of the logins. We're gonna put it on a worksheet name called the logins. I'm gonna use this, move to start. So now this worksheet is gonna be the first worksheet that we see. And we're gonna add a title background color of yellow, just so you can see what's going on. I'm gonna freeze the top row because that'll make it easier for Ben to scroll through the data, but still be able to see the column headings. And we'll keep our show equals true. Once we've set up those, we can then add get DBA login, so get our results and we'll pass it down the pipeline to export Excel. And we say to export Excel, hey, use the export Excel parameters variable. 
but we reference it slightly confusingly. We reference it with an at symbol. So you will see here that this one is an at, whereas oh yeah, there we go. Whereas that one is a dollar sign. So a dollar sign up there, and we've got an at sign there. So we can run that. And the other advantage of using splatting is it's nice and easy to change this to be number two, add something in here. You can quickly see how you can use this and expand on it and use it in different circumstances. If we look at our Excel sheet, you can see it's brought our worksheet to the front, it's made of the first one. And we've got the logins, which I made yellow just so that it will stand out and you can see that it's worked. So that's neat. So how about you start making use of this? So imagine something goes wrong. Well, something goes wrong, we could get our services. So we can pass in the path and the auto filter and the auto size and the title. But if you look at the title, we can actually put variables into our title. So we're gonna say in the title, give me the name of the computer that I'm running against. Have the worksheet name, we're gonna to move to start. And this time we're going to move, we're gonna change the background color to dark gray. And what I didn't show in the previous, let's come back to here, was I actually made a fatal error. And if I'd given this um, worksheet to Ben, he would have moaned at me because when we started scrolling, oh, we actually haven't got the row that we want to freeze because we just used freeze top pane. Whereas with this freeze pane parameter here, it says, tell me where you would like to freeze. And I would like to freeze after row three, or sorry, at the beginning of row three and at the beginning of column zero. So if we look at our Excel sheet, at the beginning of row three, now we can freeze our pane. And if we change that to a one, it would just freeze the first column. If we changed it to a six, it would go further over. So you can build up your Excel sheets, however it is that you want them to be. We could do the processes. I'm not gonna run this one because this one takes a fair amount of time to run in that it takes a minute or three to run. But maybe we could go and look at our event locks. And this time we're going to have our splat for a single Excel workbook. We're gonna put a title of event log on, move to start, have a title background color, and we're going to freeze the pane. And we're going to use the command get win event, pick up the log name system, take the last hundred events, and export them to Excel. But we're going to put the worksheet name with this command. And then with the next one, we're going to take the application and we're going to add the show at the end. So we run that and we get our Excel sheet. It has our application event log and our system event log, all available to us, all filterable, all with the panes fro frozen as we expect. Could you just push that Excel slightly more to the right because it was cut off on the left? This Excel sheet, like this. Just to the other direction. We were not able to see the tabs. So you were not oh, able to see the worksheet names. That's very true. I hadn't noticed that. I will remember that. Thank you very much. So yes, yeah, so we've got our tabs down at the bottom. Awesome. Um, SQL error logs are another good thing that we would, might want to put into our um, into our Excel sheet. If we're chasing what happened when, maybe we can do that. All of this looks exactly the same. We're going to use the command get DBA error lock. We'll press play. <clears throat> and this time we get an Excel sheet. And let's move that over yonder. There we go. <clears throat> so you can see what's happening. And this is our SQL error lock. 
Now, maybe we just want to do everything in a single workbook. Of course, we can do that. There's no reason why not. We can pick up our parameters and set them for a single Excel sheet. We'll do our auto size and auto filter because that's going to apply for every sheet. We'll add move to the start. So then the last thing that we run is going to be the first worksheet. And we'll add freeze top row. And we've taken away the title because we don't really need it. And this time we're going to run our services, our Windows events, our error logs, all into the same workbook and put them onto individual worksheets. So you can see we've got each one available to us here. So hopefully this is neat and you're beginning to think of ways that we could make use of this. Information that you can gather automatically with PowerShell that won't have errors. We'll get that 88% 80, 80, of work, uh, workbooks with errors in way down. And put all of this information into these worksheets. But actually, if I gave that to Ben, he wouldn't necessarily know all that we had, what all of this was. So how about if we gave him a front page which had all the information that we had? So now we're starting to write a real proper PowerShell script. We saw right at the beginning, you're just gonna start with getting the results of your commands and just putting them straight into Excel. And that's gonna work beautifully. But now let's take it a step further. Let's choose the instance we're gonna run up against, format our date, add the directory where we would like to save this Excel and create an Excel file path, which is the directory and the date an incident for and the name of the SQL instance. Now, warning, if you're gonna do this in a production environment, you're probably going to need to think about how you um, filter some of these names, because if you're using instance names, you need those for connecting to SQL, but you can't use the slash in the file name, etc. So you're gonna to need to work out how you build these up. We have our same export Excel parameters, we fill our worksheets with our data in the same way. And then we haven't got a show here. So we're not gonna open our Excel uh, workbook here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use this open Excel package. And what this does is it goes and grabs our file and it brings it into memory for import Excel to work with. And normally people are starting to think, hang on a minute, you're running this on a machine with Office on it with Excel installed. I really want to automate this. And I've seen dbatools.io slash agent. So I know that I could automate things with PowerShell via SQL Server so I can keep them in, under my control and monitor them. And I can run that PowerShell and schedule it. But my SQL instance doesn't have Excel and, and I can't install it on a server operating system, even if I could persuade anybody to let me and to license it. It's okay, no problem. You do not need to have Excel installed or Office installed on any machine to be able to use this command. All you need is the import Excel module, which you download from the PowerShell gallery, and that will have everything with it that you need to be able to interact with Excel. And that's what it's gonna do here. It's gonna use the add worksheet command. Surprisingly, that's going to add us a new worksheet. It's gonna add it to the package that we've opened and it's gonna call it title and it's gonna move it to the start. And we're gonna add a pipeline of out null because we don't need to see the results. We don't need it printed out of the screen that it's done that, we're quite happy. Then we need to do a little tiny bit of work. So we've got to look at our Excel workbook package. We've got to choose the workbook property and then say, let's have a look at all the worksheets. And I want to work with the title, sorry, with the worksheet named title, named title. And then we're going to pat that into 
a variable here. And then we've got, we've set our date. For our title sheet, we're going to look at the cells. We're going to look at the cell A1, and we're going to set the value to some words that we've decided to add. So this is how we could build up our Excel sheet with um, text that we want to add into it. And then we could even use variables within that to make it dynamic for our instance, or we find a problem or whatever it is. And then the next thing that we do is we set Excel range. And the Excel range is enabling us to format the text that we've entered. So we've got a worksheet, it's our title worksheet. We've picked our range. This time we're just doing the first um, row in the first column, the first cell, if you like. And then we're gonna say, I'd like it to be bold. I'd like font size to be 22. We'll have it underlined. No, you know what? Let's make sure Ben knows it's really important. We're gonna have it double underlined. And once you've done that, then just close the Excel package. Thank you very much. Just save it back to disk. And then we're gonna open it at the end. So to run that, not gonna take all that long to run. And now Ben can open the worksheet and it says, this worksheet shows the system event log, application event log, services, processes, and SQL error log for the bid desktop at the 11th of November, 2020. So all of the information that my user needs and down at the bottom, we have each one of our tabs with all of that data that we've gathered. So that's neat. It is underlined twice, so it does look important. Absolutely. Let's see, it, it works. Phew. So, of course, as with all users, Ben likes pretty pictures. So what he would like to do is to say to Rob, you should have pressed play before you started talking. But then Richard said, actually, we like to gather data from our SQL instance. So I've chosen a well-known bicycle manufacturer and we're gonna get the top 25,000 um, sales orders. Uh, we just write ourselves a T-SQL query and then we make the results of this command equal to a variable. And we pass in the query using invoke DBA query, SQL instance, our database and the query variable. And we just export those straight to Excel. And that's just going to chuck these out into Excel. And it's failed to save because, oh, I don't quite know why it thinks it's failed to save because it's blatantly here. And what you can see here is that we've got our name, our order date and our order quantity for our results. Um, oh, ah, that's not so good, is it? Because as well as that, we've also got row error, row state, table item array, has error, all of this stuff has been added to our results, which is, is a bit of a blow really because it would be nice if we, we didn't do that. So the PowerShell way of getting rid of this is to run the same query, but this time we'll add this to the end. And we say, we're gonna run down the pipeline and we're gonna say select star dash exclude property. So select everything except for any properties columns, if you like, that are called item array, row error, row state, table, or has errors. And one of the reasons I talk so much during that is because it takes time to do it because PowerShell is row by row processing of this. But you can see that in our Excel, we've got na name, order date, order quantity, and that's all that's gone through. It's just something to be aware of. How about if we add all of our formatting in? We'll have a table name of beards are awesome. And you've got a style. So you could pick a table style, chosen the dark one, because it made me chuckle. And now we've got our table. You can add the style that you want. 
We've got all of our orders saved straight into Excel, ready for Ben to process however he wants. But actually, I said he wanted to see pretty pictures. Okay, well, let's take, uh, yeah, let's run that now. <clears throat> let's take our query, and this time we'll make it slightly different. So we'll just do a select with a group by on um, year and total sales. And we're gonna export our Excel parameters. These are the ones that you've already seen, except we've added one called auto name range here. And then we've got another splat. So we're gonna have our splat for our chart definition. And our chart definition is gonna be a beardy chart. It's going to be clustered column chart. <clears throat> the X range is going to be the year, which is the year from our results here. And that's why we need this auto name range equals true. And we'll have our Y range as total sales. And this column is where would you like me to place this chart on this worksheet? And we'll not have a legend because why not? Let's just not have a legend. And we're gonna do something else this time as well. We're gonna take our results and pass them down the pipeline to our export Excel with the parameters. And I'm gonna add this pass through parameter. And that is going to pass all of this Excel package into Excel variable. It's the same as saving it and then reopening the package, but we can just do it all in one hit. For some reason that I don't understand, in <clears throat> the notebook, it gives me this strange error, which is a lie because it has done everything that it says, but it's a notebook thing that I don't get. Because the next thing that we're gonna do, now that we've got our Excel package, is we're gonna remove that annoying sheet one, because we don't need it, it's just there annoying us. So we'll take away sheet one from our Excel, and then we're gonna add in our chart definition. And this time we're gonna run export Excel from the package, add the chart definition, and the worksheet name is gonna be Beards Are Awesome. And that means that, there we go. Now we've now got our table and we've got our chart. Ben's happy, he's got a pretty picture, he's got some results to, to work with. Of course, I'm a DBA. I like donuts. Um, and it's a standing joke to, to wind the BI people up because why not? But we can make donut charts or pie charts with import Excel, okay? So this is the beardy chart of total sales by year as a donut because Rob loves donuts. Easy. But pivot tables are also useful. Press play because this takes a minute to go. <clears throat> now we're going to run this command and we're going to get all of the uh, names of the orders, the dates, the quantity from that um, order details table, which has got about 125,000 rows in it. And then we're going to pass that down the pipeline and run this select. And I show you this because just to give you an idea of how long it's going to take to do all that processing. And to tell you that really the better way of doing it is just to pipe those results into Excel with export Excel and then use the module to remove the columns with those five ones that we don't need. So that's a much better way of doing it. But we've done it this way to show you the point and we're gonna do the same sort of thing. So we're now going to create our export Excel parameter splat. It's gonna to go to a file path. The worksheet name is gonna be base query. Create our table in the same way, a dark one. Beards are awesome. We'll have auto size, auto filter, move to start. We're gonna freeze the top row. We're even gonna show the Excel file and we'll add our pass through. And that thing means it hasn't worked. Is there another Bing that means it has worked? Hmm, that's interesting. 
because this worked on Monday in the precon. What have we done here? Why have you not? Why are you no work? Let me make sure. I'm pretty sure that that didn't exist. I'm going to say yes to that. And I'm going to do this to save us from having to process that data again. I'm going to do that and see what we get. So what we're going to do, as well as creating our Excel, is create a pivot table. So it's going to be beardy pivot. I'm going to put it on the base query worksheet. And we're going to add in our pivot data. And our pivot data, when you add it in in Excel, it says, do you want a sum or an average or a mean or all of these things? And we do the same thing. We create a hash table, just like a splat. And we pass in order quantity and we're going to choose sum. And then we're going to have our pivot rows. Those are going to be our order date and our name. And this time I didn't hear a bing, which means that we've got a pivot table. So I don't know why it binged the first time. So we've got our pivot table. We can right click on this one and we can collapse it. And it's, yeah, honestly, if I gave that to Ben, he'd be saying, well, where's my magic? date thing where I can do month and year and quarter. Oh, well, you know what? We can do that for you. So this time I'm not gonna run the query. We've got our results saved in this result variable. And what we're gonna have, I'll press play, get it, set it running. So the beginning part is just the same, but this time, as well as our pivot data and our pivot row, we're going to group by the date row, order date. And I would like to have these date parts, years, months, and dates. And we'll choose a style for our pivot table because Ben deserves style. So once that's run, it's going to do the same thing again the first time. That's very peculiar. Right, we're going to change that because the beauty of this is now we can try up here. We'll just do Ben's pivot to data query. And I think that was the issue in the beginning that it didn't have my name in it. Um, we shall find out. We shall definitely find out. Okay. Um, By the way, Rob, are you aware, is, is there an, a PowerShell module that would do the same thing that you're showing us here, but not for Excel, but for Google Sheets? I honestly don't know. I can, I can go and find out. If some, whoever asked that would like to um, ping me on um, Twitter, I can go and find out if that's a problem. Excellent, thank you. And, and you're absolutely correct, Ben. The one that's named Ben blatantly just worked. And now we've got ourselves our pivot table and we can quite happily get all of our data down however we would like it to be. So to just for, please excuse me for one second. Come in. Come on. Right. Let me tell you the problem. Here is the problem. This is Seek. Seek would like to be here, probably on the windowsill, watching what's going on. So there we go. So this, is, this Ben is the point where he might accidentally mute me. So we've got our pivot table in our Excel sheet and Ben would like to have a pivot chart as well. Runs exactly the same way. So we have created our pivot table. Everything is the same except that this time we've added a chart type, clustered column, and a title, and the chart column is where we would like it to be placed. If we have a look here, uh, no, I didn't want to start Excel in safe mode. Thank you very much. Uh, close. So have a look, there's our beardy chart. Ah, 
I've obviously made the same error again and A actually pressed down um, control whilst running, whilst trying to open Excel, which apparently makes it try and start in um, safe mode, which I didn't know until I started doing these, um, these scripts. And any second now, there we go. We're going to get our pivot table with our pivot. Calm down. There we go. With our pivot chart as well. So now Ben is completely happy. Are you happy, Ben? I am so happy. And did you, I don't know if you ever noticed, but Beardy Chart, that works perfectly well to the melody of Baby Shark. Just saying. <laughs> Beardy Chart, Beardy Chart, do, 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 Beardy, Beardy Chart. Yeah, we could, we could do this. And so, Andy's will not be able to get that out of their heads. Apologize uh, for that. Sorry, not sorry. sorry. Uh, absolutely not sorry. So let's do something else. Our last demo. Let's do something cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to just dive into Visual Studio Code. And this PowerPoint slobs is the PowerShell that I use to make myself appear within the um, workbooks. But also, we're going to like to the right again, please. Oh, yes, because we're not full screen, even though we think we're full screen. We are not quite. So let's go like this. And that looks pretty good to me. There we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to dynamically create some logins and some users in our databases, and we're going to add them to a particular role. So I've got a number of logins. I've got Benji and, and B. Weisman. That's obviously his official account as well as his special account. And then we've got Andre Kaman and Andy Levy and all of these cool people all the way through, right the way to William Durkin at the end. And we will then use get random to randomly pick how many databases we add them to. And then we're going to use get random to randomly pick which roles we add them to. So we're going to start that running and we're going to pick up Azure Data Studio and we're going to look and we're going to say, look, we've got, these are our databases, which you can't see because I've moved it over there a bit. There we go. Like that. So here, here are our databases, uh, Ben, which ones do you think you should have access to? Well, I usually think I should have access to all of them, but the most important database for me, obviously, is AdventureWorks 2017. AdventureWorks 2017. Righty-ho. Okay, that's, uh, that's good. So we shall find out shortly if that's what you get. So what we're going to do, once this script is running, there we go, it's still running, is we're going to create ourselves an Excel sheet dynamically that has all of the permissions for all of the users on this instance. And it's going to use all of the code that you've already seen. Just put it together into big one long big list. And we use this at a client to enable them <clears throat> to uh, allow the service desk or the people interfacing between the business and IT to be able to run the notebook and return an Excel sheet that was color coded with all the permissions on it. So that the DBA team didn't have to continually keep giving this information to them. Now, of course, there are other ways of accomplishing this task, but this is what their team manager wanted. And so this is what we, we enabled for them. Um, we choose a directory and an instance. We then have to remember I said earlier about making sure that we um, pass our instance name correctly to so that it'll fit into a file name. Create our file name. These are things that you've seen before. And then get DBA user permission and pick our instance. And that's going to then run to export Excel with all the things that you expect, water size, freeze top row, water filter, and a pass through. 
<clears throat> and then we're going to do this. We're going to add some conditional formatting. So now we can dynamically create our Excel sheet so that it'll work like we've just dumped some data into it and color code the results. And we're actually going to use, we could do greater than and less than, you can do that sort of formatting, absolutely. But what we're going to use is actually an Excel format. And the Excel format, if I can ever work on the right button, is not. So we don't want to worry about any of these errors. I want you to find Mises Admin in the G column or DB owner. We've got our server logins and our securables and our DB role members and our DB securables. And depending on if you find those, <clears throat> then you can add the conditional formatting and take the background color to be yellow. And in fact, most of them are stop if true, and we'll have different colors for different things. And what I also want to do, that's a bit annoying, isn't it? I can't get to that at the same place. Um, where have we gone? There we are. <clears throat> now, to enable that, I've done it backwards because to be able to do our conditional formatting, what we need to be able to do is to create ourselves a splat with the address. And the address looks like this. This is where we would like to apply our formatting. It's address on the dimension, on the worksheet name that's part of worksheets that's in our workbook. And we need to also pass it in which worksheet we're in. I know it doesn't make sense, but that's what we need to do. And we pick our rule type. So we've got expression there. It can be greater than, it can be less than. There are the other expressions that you would expect from uh, conditional formatting choices with Excel. And once we've done that, we're then going to open our Excel package again and create a worksheet name title and just like we did before, we're gonna get our date and we're gonna tell our user, this worksheet shows the user permissions for every database on this instance. We'll give them some information. We'll even give them the colors so they can see what's going. And we use set Excel range to do that again, just tells us what to do as well as being able to format our text. We can also use it just to <clears throat> create little blocks of color. And then we press play. And probably I should have checked to make sure that PowerShell code had finished, finished working, but I'm pretty sure that it has. Let's have a quick look. Yep, that's all gone. The sock factory has got William Durkin on it. So we, we know that much. And then we end up with an Excel sheet that we don't want to maximize because we're only sharing part of our screen. There we go, that looks about right. And now, when Ben looks at this worksheet, it tells him the worksheet shows the user permissions. We've got our color coding, tells us which cells are which, and you can filter by database on the object column, and you can filter by user, or group, or login on the member column. Okay, so we go to permissions. Boom, look at that, color coded. So we can see what we've got. And let's have a look at our members, and we'll look for. Um, do we want to see what both accounts have permission to, Ben? Yes, please. Okay, both of them, right. So we'll, we'll have a look here. So now we can see that both Benji and Ben are server logins, as we would expect. And there we go, look, see, Benji has permissions to AdventureWorks 2017. <laughs> Unfortunately, he can only write to it. Can't read from it, although strangely he can um, control access, which seems a bit odd to me. For the Beard Factory, obviously, because I, I know and trust Benji, he can both read and not read and write and not write, um, but he can do backups. So be interesting to know how those permissions are going to work for him. As B. Schroding has read permissions. Yeah. As B. Weisman, then we've got DB owner marked out in yellow so we can see what we've got. And as well as that, you've got access to the car factory, to the reporting and the DW. You've got read, look, the proper permission. 
actually got data reader for the DW database. I laugh because I've done this demonstration probably a dozen times and most of the time we come out with completely silly um, permission grants but this one actually is actually given us one single one that is that is correct and apparently you're also interested in um, CICD Ben because you've got access to the quick release um, database which is what controls the CICD for uh, our factory um, processing plant. I love CICD, so that's excellent. That's all I need. AdventureWorks CICD, I'm all set. Excellent. So we won't save that one. We'll come to here and say thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rob Sewell. I am known as he or him. This is where you can find me. I hope you have a wonderful past summit. And are there any questions? There are, and um, maybe you still want to bring up your contact details um, just again, um, so people can see that for uh, slightly longer. So uh, Nikki has actually two questions um, on all that awesome stuff that you did there, but how would you automate that? Would you always have to go to Azure Data Studio and actually run that code, or is there a way of actually running a notebook from the outside? Um, if I was going to automate it, I would use um, SQL Agent to run a PowerShell script. And that would run following the instructions at dbatools.io slash agent. Um, and because it was running as an agent script, I, I wouldn't um, need to have all the documentation in it. Uh, you can run notebooks as agent jobs if you set them up in Azure Data Studio. If your instance is above SQL 2016, it might be 17, I can't remember which. Um, it's definitely not 2014 because that's where I tried it. But this will only work for SQL notebooks and not for PowerShell notebooks. And obviously we need to have PowerShell to do import Excel. All right, excellent. And then we got um, one follow-up question there, uh, also from Nikki, um, which is uh, slightly off topic. Um, so with um, Excel usage um, that's scheduled through um, the SQL agent um, for PowerShell jobs, um, they often get a com object that is left open and locks all the other jobs. Do you have any ideas about that? Um, um, immediately, I'll... otherwise um, Nikki may want to just reach out to you. As get well. in touch, but I would say probably because you're not closing the um, com object at the end and in fact destroying it so as well as uh, when you've got a, a com object let's call it dollar excel after you've saved it you can do a dot close uh, open brace close brace and that'll close it and then you can double check that with a i'm pretty sure it's destroy it might be remove one of the two Excellent. And then we have a couple of comments on the chat. Um, something like uh, along the lines of thanks so much, Rob. Um, thank you, Rob. Awesome session. I also got a couple of isolated thank you. So I'm not quite sure if that just relates to this session or maybe just to the fact um, that um, some of them will be singing um, BD chart for the rest of the day. Excellent. Um, we may have that. to follow up on that. But um, either way, thank you so much, my friend. That was awesome. Good. Thank you very much. And you got to see Seek. Destroy didn't want to come in, but everybody got to see Seek. Oh, and we got um, one more question that just popped in. Um, what's the minimum version of PowerShell to be able to use um, import Excel module? Would that work with 4.0 um, or anything earlier or later? Or um, Honestly, I have no idea, um, but let's do this and then we can find out because we have just a couple of seconds left, don't we? We do. So we can come to here and we can go to the PowerShell gallery and we can search that for import Excel and in here, and this is the same for a, a, any module, we will see uh, under package details, no, under file list, shouldn't be under file list, somewhere there should be a minimum version Well, blow me down with a feather if Doug hasn't got it in here. Um, in which case, I don't honestly know. I was fully expecting if you went to, um, 
and check that I'm correct, but if we go to DBA tools, come on into webs. Here we go. Minimum PowerShell version is three for DBA tools. And when we were in import Excel, it's not set. So with it not being set, uh, it's going to import into any version of PowerShell. Whether it runs or not, I don't know. If it doesn't, then um, get in touch with, uh, with Doug. Sounds good. All right, um, famous last words. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. And um, seems like um, people very much agree with the naming choice of your cats. I kind of gave away that. Um, <laughs> 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 they are seek and destroy. Yes, and they are seek and destroy. Yes, I was uh, I was overruled and outvoted on Twitter. So thank you, Twitter. <laughs> But they are more than happy with that. Excellent. Thank you, Rob, and thanks everyone for attending and have a great rest of uh, this um, past virtual summit. Don't miss the keynote.